Okay. So we are going to be finishing chapter 11. Starting with number 20. All right, so this is a similar problem. We're classifying linear and nonlinear relationships. And so for A, a positive linear relationship, that's going to be figure two. It's linear, right? The data points fall along what's close to a line, right? We see a linear relationship and it has a positive slope. So that's a positive linear relationship. A negative linear relationship is in figure three. These fall along a line with a negative slope. Part C says, which data set appears to show a relationship that is nonlinear? Okay, so here we can see that's an exponential decay situation there, a function. So that has a nonlinear relationship. Figure one has no relationship. Okay. So here's another one. Which data appears to show a positive linear relationship? So that's going to be figure three, a negative, that's figure one, negative linear. No relationship is figure two, and a nonlinear relationship. So that's figure four. All right. So that's 20 and 21. And now for 22, we're talking about the difference between correlation and causation. And I'm going to pull up the Alex explanation here. So two quantities have a correlation if they tend to vary together. When we start learning about um, these kinds of, you know, the second algebra, where two quantities vary directly or have an inverse relationship. Uh, so suppose there are more bees in a yard when there are more flowers. So as the number of flowers increases, the number of bees increase. So there's some correlation. There's a relationship between the number of bees and the number of flowers. And I'll suppose less coffee is consumed when the temperature is higher. So there is a relationship, a correlation between the amount of coffee consumed and the temperature. And so in the first example with the bees and the flowers, that was a positive correlation, right? As the number of flowers increased, the number of bees increased. That's going to give you a positive slope. Here, when the temperature is higher, less coffee is consumed. Less coffee is consumed as we go from left to right. So that's a negative correlation. Correlation does not imply causation. That is like a huge, huge statement right there. Causation means that a change in one quantity directly causes a change in the other. That's different than ha just having a correlation. Okay, so causation can only be shown by a controlled experiment. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's, let's just get I'm kind of looking for particular example here to show you. Of course, it's not going to show up when I'm looking, is it? 
All right. Well, okay, let's just look at these. A golf instructor examined student data. He found that when a student takes longer to hit, it implies that the ball will land closer to the hole. So there is a correlation, but there may or may not be causation. Okay. Again, we know nothing about causation without some sort of very intense controlled experiment. Okay. A city conducted a traffic study. It reported that having more signals does not indicate a shorter or a longer commute time. So there's no correlation. Okay. Sunshine. Honey bunny. Employees at a large office building took a survey. The revolt results show that those who began work earlier tended to drink less tea. Okay, so there is a correlation. There may or may not be causation. And I'll tell you, we have not done any kind of studies in this class where we have proved causation or given evidence of causation. Okay, so all of these are either going to be no correlation or there is a correlation and there may or not may not be causation. Uh, a piano instructor examined student process, progress. He noticed that when students spend less time playing video games, their memorization ability tends to increase. So there is a correlation. Uh, there may or may not be causation. An environmental study was conducted. It reported that houses with more inhabitants do not necessarily produce more or less trash. So there's no correlation. Data was collected at a pool. It showed that building, being older does not imply that a swimmer will, will stay for a shorter or a longer amount of time. So there's no correlation. Okay. All right. So that's the correlation and causation. And now interpreting the slope of least squares regression line. So might we be able to predict life expectancies from birth rates below our bivariate data giving birth rate which is on the x-axis, and life expectancy for each of 12 countries. For each of the countries, both x, the number of births per 1,000 people in the population, and y, the female life expectancy in years, is our given. Also shown are the scatter plot for the data and the least squares regression line. The equation for this line is given here. Um, for these data, the female life expectancies that are less than the mean of the female life expectancies tend to be paired with birth rates that are greater than or less than the mean of the birth rates. So first we'll look at the Alex explanation. And notice we can send the data to the calculator for either the X or the Y, and then we can get the means because we're looking to compare to the means. Okay. So look for A. We draw dotted lines on the scatter plot at both the sample mean of the birth rates and the sample mean of the female life expectancies. Okay, so again, you could send the data to the calculator for a birth rate. While it's highlighted, click on the mean. You get a little over 33. Okay, so that's this vertical dotted line. That's the mean of X. 
And then the mean of y sixty six point three four about. Okay. And now again, it's asking, um, they don't repeat the question down here, but they say female life expectancies that are less than the mean of the female life expectancies. So that's below the mean of Y. Are paired with birth rates that are greater than the mean of the birth rate. Okay. And then um, the equation of the least regression line, it gives you that slope. It's the predicted amount of change in the y variable given an increase of one unit in the x variable. So in other words, that negative 0.48. Right, that's the slope. And we can think of that, that slope. So it's negative 0 0.48. So again, we could think of that as with one more you know, birth per 1,000, the life expectancy decreases by almost half a year. Okay. Oh, okay, I'll show the, the Alex version. So as mentioned, the slope is the predicted amount of change of Y given an increase of one we could always write a number over one in the x variable. So in this problem, the slope is negative 0.48, which means for an increase of one birth per 1,000 people in the birth rate, sunshine, there is a predicted decrease of 0.48 years in female life expectancy. Right, and this is because of you know, access to health care and things like that, probably education, birth control, all sorts of socioeconomic type factors. Now, notice also we're talking about a decrease. So we don't need to put a negative in there. We're only saying it's a decrease of 0.48. So the decrease part is already accounting for that negative. Okay. All right, so here an advertising firm wishes to demonstrate to its clients the effectiveness of the advertising campaigns it has conducted. The following bivariate data on 12 recent campaigns, including the cost of each campaign in millions of dollars and the resulting percentage increase in sales following the campaign were presented by the firm. Based on these data, we would compute the least squares regression line with X being that campaign cost and Y, the resulting percentage increase in sales. Okay, and then for these data, values for percentage increase in sales that are less than the mean. So let's go ahead and just put the means on there. This is the campaign cost. Uh, 2.63 millions of dollars, okay? So I don't have the option of doing a dotted line, but um, it's the X bar there. And then we'll send the Y data, which is the increase in sales percent and get the mean. 6.64, roughly. And that's percentage.
Okay, so this question is saying for these data, values for percentage increase in sales that are less than the mean. Okay, so we're looking at all of these that are less than the mean for the percentage increase in sales um, tend to be paired with values for the campaign cost. Right now, most of these are to the left of the mean of the campaign cost. Right? So most of them are less than the mean of the values for the campaign cost. And then it says, according to the regression equation, for an increase of $1 million in advertising campaign cost, there is a corresponding increase of 0.19 percentage points right, in sales. Okay. The cat is yelling, yelling, yelling. I don't know why. Sunshine. So one more, theater revenue versus rental revenue, right? And we've seen these kind of problems before. So um, we've got bivariate data um, from a sample of 15 comedies. The movie studio, studio wishes to determine the relationship between the revenue from rental of comedies on streaming services and the revenue generated from the theatrical release. Right? So I you know, this is a perfect example of, you know, the theater revenue doesn't cause the rental revenue. I mean, there might be some kind of causation effect because of marketing or word of mouth or social media marketing that comes from a theater release. But, you know, there are other factors, I would think, that drive that. Um, you know, more precisely or more effectively. So anyways, um, so these are 15 comedies. You've got the data. They've done the scatter plot. They've drawn in the least squares regression line. They've given you the equation of the least squares regression line. And then for these data, values... For theater revenue that are less than the mean. And so let's get the means, right? Theater revenue mean is 34, roughly. That pin again. And then the rental revenue mean is about 8.33. That's millions of dollars. 8.33. So halfway between here is nine. So I'm just trying to guesstimate there. Okay. So this is the Y bar, this is the X bar. All right, so it says for these data, values for theater revenue that are less than the mean. Right? These are all the data with theater revenue less than the mean of the theater revenue. And they tend to be paired with 
Y value or rental revenue values that are less than the mean of the rental revenue. You see that? There are only two above here. The rest are all below the Y bar. The mean of the values of the rental revenue. Okay. And then according to the regression equation, for an increase of $1 million, that's for every X equals one, Y increases by 0.15. There's a corresponding increase of how many of these millions? 0.15. Okay. All right. So that was 23 and 24. And then here we go. This is your very last question. In Alex, right? Interpreting the equation of the least squares regression line to make predictions. So, might we be able to predict life expectancies? Um, below or bivariate data, same kind of thing, birth rate, female life expectancy. We've got 12 countries, we've got the scatter plot and the least squares regression line. And now it's saying, from the regression equation, what is the predicted female life expectancy when the birth rate is 21.8 births? So you're just going to put 21.8 into this equation. Okay. When the birth rate is 21.8, the predicted female life expectancy is 72.1. And part B was to find the predicted female life expectancy for a birth rate of 18.4 births per 1,000. And then you get 73.8. So those we are just substituting in. Uh, all right, this is the advertising firm. Depends on how much money you spend, right? And you can expect, hopefully, an increase in sales. You spend a lot marketing. These are both asking for you to use the regression equation. I want to find a problem that asks you to use both the regression equation and the observed data. I can. Okay, so again, we've got birth rate, female life expectancy for these uh, 12 countries. Now notice here, what was the observed female life expectancy when the birth rate was 15.7? So here, when the birth rate was 15.7 per 1,000 people, the observed female life expectancy was 75.1 years. And then it says from the regression equation, what's the predicted female life expectancy when the birth rate is 15.7? So then you put 15.7 into that equation Right. And we get to one or more decimal places, 74, I'll just enter the whole thing, 74.948. 
And so notice, you know, it's perfectly fine to have a difference in an observed rate and a predicted rate. Um, you know, what was observed was part of the calculation for us to even derive this least squares regression line. But then we use the equation to make predictions for future usage, okay? So that's gonna be your best predicting tool for the future. Uh, note that even though the female life expectancy was observed to be 75.1 years, it's predicted from the regression equation. And um, they have a nice explanation in here. It may seem strange that the least squares regression equation is used to predict a value of y, even though you have the observed value in there already. After all, if the value of y already has been observed, wouldn't the observed that value be more informative than a predicted one? Predicted one. Perhaps it would but the observed value of y isn't necessarily the best prediction for a future value of y. In fact, assuming that there's an underlying linear relationship between x and y, the best prediction of a future value of y corresponding to a given value of x is always in using that regression equation. Okay, and they also point out some care needs to be taken in making predictions from the regression equation. In particular, we make prediction predictions from values outside the range of observed values. Okay, so here, right, we only have observed values between there and there, right? That's how we got that regression line. And so the regression line is really good for predicting values for x values within here. This, by the way, is called interpolation. Inter meaning between. So when the x values are between, you know, the values used in that range, you're interpolating. Interpolating or interpolation. If you go outside that range over here, this is called extrapolation. And you guys have probably heard of extrapolating before. This is not as precise as we can see here, right? Because if we kept using that equation of the line, we would have been using, you know, out here negative values for y, when obviously they're they're not. There's a whole different trend over here. So that is worthy of note. Okay. So that's it, you guys. You did it. You got through all of this Alex info. Let's take a break here and we'll come back and we'll review for the final. Okay, welcome back. So I have uploaded a copy of this hard copy practice final. The actual practice final is in Alex. And I totally recommend you all do it, okay? But I have uploaded a copy in both module 15 and module 16. I'll pull up. Fine. Just so. Uh, 
sure when my internet is like this. There we go. So it's this green highlighted practice final. Okay. And then in module 16 also. Okay. So, all right, let's take a look at this. We start off with classification of variables. And so this is determining whether a variable is categorical or qualitative or quantitative. And an amount in pounds, so that's a number of pounds of weight that's quantitative. Eye color, there's no number involved, so that's categorical. Annual salary in dollars, right? That's the number of dollars, so that is quantitative. And then the number of temperatures, uh, the number of degrees, right? Temperature, that's quantitative. All right, then differentiating between parameters and statistics. So remember, parameters are numbers that describe populations. And then statistics describe samples. And it's handy that, you know, parameter and population begins with P and statistics and sample begins with S. So here we've got... Maya, a nurse manager at a local hospital, wanted to know about the hospital's full-time nurses. She pulled 10 of them at random who worked full-time. The findings were that these nurses take on average 5.8 sick days per year. Six, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so identify the population and the sample. The population is the bigger group that we're really trying to study. So that's all the full-time nurses who work at the hospital. Whereas the sample, it's the 10 randomly chosen nurses. And then any number given up in above that's describing all the full-time nurses, that's a parameter. And then any number regarding the randomly chosen nurses in the sample, that's a statistic. All right, then here we have a relative frequency histogram. Students at a major university in Southern California are complaining about a serious housing crunch. They're stating that many of the university students have to commute too far to school because there's not enough housing near campus. This reminds me of my time at UCLA. It was very expensive to live near campus. But then if you live too far away, then transportation was a serious issue. So. The university officials' response is to perform a study, and the study reported in the school newspaper contains the following histogram summarizing the commute distances for 100 students. So we have 26 students commuting relatively closely, 26 between four and eight miles. You know, in LA, that's still quite a commute, right? And then 18 out of 100 between eight and 12, et cetera, et cetera. So based on the histogram, find the proportion that are at least four miles, okay? And write your answer as a decimal. So all of the ones at least four miles are all of these. So you can add them up and divide by the 100 and you get 74% or 0.74. You could also note it's everything except the 26 out of 100. So there's 74 left, right? All right, and here we get shopping times and minutes for each of 18 shoppers at a local grocery. And you're asked to group them in, you know, to find the grouped frequency distribution. So you, know, you find the number of shopping times that fall in that group and the number in that group, et cetera, and then just pull these heights up 
to give you, you know, that frequency. And this question is asking you for the five number summary and the interquartile range. So remember the five number summary, you've got the minimum and the maximum. The median is basically the idea of the middle. So if you have an odd number, the median is literally that middle number, like here, 11 is odd. If you had an even number, then you would take the average of the middle two by adding them and dividing by two. And then the lower quartile, that's the median of the lower half. So that's the middle of these five. The upper quartile, that's the median of the upper half. So that's the middle of those five. And then the interquartile range, it's the upper quartile minus the lower quartile. Here to calculate the sample standard deviation. Remember, there's a different formula for a population standard deviation. The button in the Alex calculator, S sub X, calculates the sample standard deviation for you. So you could send the data to the calculator while it's highlighted, press the S sub X button. Okay, so here you're given an X value, a data value, and you're asked to convert it to a Z score. So the year Dante graduated college, he got a job as an entry-level software engineer working for a firm in the U.S. His starting salary was $59,000. Then for the year he graduated, the starting salaries of all entry-level software engineers had a mean of $61,000 and a standard deviation of $2,270. Find the Z-score of his starting salary relative to the starting salaries among all the entry-level software engineers in the U.S for the year he graduated, All right? So we use the Z equals X minus mu over sigma. Of course, realistically, it's gonna depend on what region or state, you know, he's working in. Because salaries in say the San Francisco Bay area are gonna be way more than in, you know, somewhere in the middle of the country you know, Mississippi or something like that with a much lower cost of living. Anyways, here we have a two-way frequency table. Dr. Wynn is a vet who sees only dogs and cats. In each appointment, she, she may or may not give the animal a vaccine. And this two-way frequency table summarizes 70 appointments for her last week. So dog is the event that a randomly chosen appointment involved a dog. No vaccine means the appointment did not include a vaccine. So A, find the probability that the randomly selected appointment involved a dog. So you're going to add all the dog ones in this row, 7 plus 21, and divide by the total number of appointments. The probability that the appointment did not include a vaccine and it involved a dog. So that's 21 out of the total 70. And then the probability that the appointment involved no vaccine given the appointment was with the dog. So now you're looking at only the row for the dogs. Okay, this is conditional probability. So given it involved a dog, this means it's only out of 28, right? What's the probability there was no vaccine? So that's 21 out of 28 or three fourths, 0.75. Here's a bigger two-way frequency table. So suppose, you had 118 doctors and nurses volunteer to run a health fair. Each volunteer worked one shift, and here's the data. What's the probability that a volunteer is a doctor or they worked the afternoon shift? So now you're going to count all of the doctors. You're also going to include all of those who worked the afternoon shift, making sure you don't double count 
these doctors who worked in the afternoon, right? So you add those four numbers and divide by the total 118. And then what's the probability the volunteer is a nurse? You're just gonna add up those three numbers of nurses out of the 118. Here is a standard deck of cards, 52 cards, 13 cards in each suit. The card is drawn, to, drawn at random. The card is not put back in the deck. And then a second card is drawn at random. What's the probability that the first card is a heart and the second card is a spade? So the probability the first card is a heart you have 13 hearts out of 52 cards. Now that card is not put back. So the second card being a spade, you have 13 spades out of 51 cards left. And then you can multiply straight across and round your answer to four decimal places. All right, there's 34,000 adults living in Palm City. In examining attitudes towards the news, a research group asked a random sample of adults in Palm City, what is your main source of news? And there are the results in the table. Based on the sample, predict the number of adults in Palm City whose main source is newspapers or the internet. So in the sample, you would add the number get their news by newspapers plus the ones using the internet out of the total in that sample 333 so that's 41.441 percent and then take that percent of which means to multiply the total 34,000 in the city and then you get 14,090 people All right, binomial problems. These are problems that have only two outcomes. We would call a success or a failure. A TV executive is interested in the popularity of a particular streaming TV show. She's been told that a whopping 68% of American households would be interested in tuning in to a new network version of the show. If this is correct, what is the probability that all six of the households in her city being monitored would tune into the new show? And consider this, you know, the six are a random sample. So you could do what I like to call the kind of hangman. You know, you draw the six possible, you know, values for each trial. And then there's a 68% probability of success for each one. You multiply them. So you get 0.68 to the sixth. Now here, this is using the binomial formula. Not all visitors to a certain company's website are customers. In fact, the website administrator estimates about 12% of the visitors to the website are actually looking for other websites. So they landed there by mistake. Assuming that estimate is correct, find the probability that in a random sample of five visitors to the website, exactly three are looking for the website. Okay, so we want to know the probability for exactly three out of the five are looking for the website. So the probability of success looking for the website, 12% are looking for others, so 88% are looking for the website. The success there is the 88%. And then use the combination, so it's five, choose three times the probability of success to the number of successes, and then the probability of failure, which is the other 12%, and then these two have to add up to five. Right? So there were three successes and two failures. Okay, and then remember that button in the Alex calculator that calculates the probability, like a binomial probability for less than or equal to a certain number of successes. So suppose 45% of all babies in a particular hospital are girls. 
if eight babies born are randomly selected, what's the probability that at most one of them are girls? So you could say, well, the probability of at most one girl, it's the probability of zero plus the probability of exactly one. And then you could use that binomial formula for zero and the binomial formula for one. But this button in Alex is actually pretty handy here because it'll give you the probability that it's less than or equal to one, which is at most one. Okay, especially for problems where you might have to, you know, add up quite a bit. All right. Here, uh, you're asked to find a raw score. So suppose that the heights of all adult women in the U.S. are normally distributed with the mean of 64, a standard deviation of 2.3. Amanda is taller than 85% of the population of U.S. women. So whatever her height is there, 85% are to the left. So that means 15% are to the right. All right. We want to find out how tall she is. We can easily find the z-score with 15% to the right. And now you have the z-score, you have the population mean and standard deviation, and you can convert that z-score back to the raw value x. So multiply both sides by sigma, and then add mu to both sides. And then I just wrote this on the right, so I could put x on the left plug in the numbers and we get she's 66.4 inches. Okay. Um, according to the records of a soft drink company, the bottle for their one liter sized product contain an average of 1.01 liters of beverage with a standard deviation 0.14 liters. As part of routine quality insurance, a sample of 70 bottles has been taken. The sample mean amount of the 70 bottles was 0.99 liters. Assuming the company's records are correct, find the probability of observing a sample mean of 0.99 liters or less in a sample of 70. So we wanna calculate the probability that that mean is less than or equal to 0.99. So, oh, if we could only have the probability of Z being less than some Z score, we could use that button in on the Alex calculator. So this is how we change to Z, right? It's X bar minus mu sub X bar over sigma sub X bar. So this is where, you know, the only difference there is you're dividing the sigma over the square root of N or 70 in this case. And then again, you could use that Alex key and you get 0.116. Okay, the lifetime of a certain brand of electric light bulb is known to have a standard deviation of 53 hours. Suppose a random sample of 100 bulbs has a mean lifetime of 500 hours. Find a 99% confidence interval for the true mean lifetime of all light bulbs of this brand, give the upper and lower limit. So this is the formula here, a 99% confidence interval. That means you have an alpha of 1% and you get a half percent in each tail. So the Z-score with a half percent to the right is 2.576. That's your critical value for Z. And then add and subtract that you know, that whole thing there, sigma over the square root of n, and you can calculate the lower and upper limits. Okay, and here's a confidence interval using a t distribution. So similar formula, but now you're going to use the sample standard deviation, and we have to use, you know, in, include the degrees of freedom for that student t test statistic there. 
right? So here we don't know what sigma is. Sigma is unknown. We've got a random sample of 17 HMOs. And here the copayment for a doctor's visit was recorded. Under the assumption that the copayment amounts are normally distributed, find a 95% confidence interval for the mean copayment. Give the lower and upper limits. So for 95%, you're going to have alpha of 5%, 2.5% in each tail. Okay, so the critical T value of 0 0.025. There are 17 HMOs, so 16 degrees of freedom. That's our T critical value. Okay, again, we plug in all of the, the values and just calculate the lower and upper limits. All right, then hypothesis testing. Um, a college claims that the proportion of students who commute more than 15 miles to school is less than 25%, and a researcher wants to test this. So that's the claim. So the null hypothesis is that the proportion P, and remember you have to use the P on the palette, equals 0.25. Right, so a random sample is used, is there enough evidence to support the claim at the 1% level of significance? So we're gonna use a Z test. You could just confirm that N times P and N times one minus P are both greater than 10. You can calculate the value of the test statistic using this formula, right? Where P hat is that sample proportion. So that's the 59 out of the 270 who commuted more than 15 miles. So you calculate that test statistic, and then to find the p-value, this is a left-tailed test. Right, so we want the probability that z is less than or equal to that z test statistic. And you get 0.116 which is greater than alpha of 0.01. So no, we do not reject the null hypothesis. Here's a t-test using the p-value method. So a coin-operated drink machine was designed to discharge a mean of six fluid ounces of coffee, coffee per cup. In the test of the machine, the discharge amounts in 16 randomly chosen cups of coffee from the machine were recorded. The sample mean and sample standard deviation were as follows. If we assume that they're approximately normal, is there enough evidence to claim that the mean mu differs from six fluid ounces? So this is a two-tailed test. They want you to use the 0.05 level of significance. You're not given sigma. So we're gonna do a t-test. This is how we calculate the test statistic and then find the p-value. This is a two-tailed test. So you want, you know, the area in both tails. The button in Alex gives you the area to the right. Remember, it's symmetric. A T distribution is symmetric. So the T statistic was negative one you're also gonna get area to the right of positive one. You can just take twice that and you get P is 0.333, which is bigger than alpha of 0.05. Okay, and then determining the null and alternative hypotheses for remember the variance of sigma squared, standard deviation is sigma. And so this question is just asking you to write out the null and alternative hypotheses. You're gonna use the palette. All right, as part of a staged rollout, a new email client was installed on some of the computers of a major company's customer service representatives. The CFRs have complained to management saying that the new client is much worse than the old one. 
So one of the company's analysts has been tasked with determining upon the busiest day of the year, the mean time and minutes spent on email by those customer service reps using the new email client is greater than the mean of the old, okay? So is the mean of mu one greater than mu two? Uh, yeah, assume that they're approximately normal. Can the analyst conclude at the 1% level of significance that the population means of the new are greater than the old? So you're not given the population standard deviation. You can calculate by sending you know, data to the calculator that uh, the sample standard deviations. And it's a, a relatively small sample, only 17. So we're going to do a t-test. This is how you calculate the t-test statistic. Remember, this is for two samples. We're assuming there's no difference, so we let that be zero. We can calculate the mean of each population by sending the data to the calculator. And similarly, we can calculate the sample standard deviations by sending the data to the calculator. So we calculate T. And then uh, P is the area to the right of that T value, it's greater than alpha of 0.01. So no, we do not reject the null hypothesis. All right, this is for paired comparison. So this is gonna be a t-test. A computer manufacturer is interested in comparing assembly times for two keyboard assembly processes, right? You've got 10 different workers and their time spent on each one of those processes in minutes. Can the company conclude at the 1% level of significance that the mean assembly time for process two exceeds or is greater than process one? So if that is greater than the time for process one, you end up with a negative difference. So the null is that the difference is zero, there's no difference. And then the claim is that the difference is negative. Again, it's a t-test, you have 10 differences, so nine degrees of freedom. This is the formula you use. You're gonna calculate the mean of that last row and the standard deviation of that last row. We're assuming that uh, the, the true mean is zero and you get your t test statistic value. Then find the critical value at the 1% level of significance. So this is a left tail test. Um, to find the critical value at the 1% level, right? You're gonna have 1% in this tail. It's gonna give you the same, uh, T value as 1% in the right tail. So you can calculate that and then just take the opposite. Right here you get 2.821. So you want the opposite, negative 2.821. And then we look to see if the T test statistic lies in that rejection region. It does not. So no, do not reject. And that's it. All right, so I'm going to turn on our recording.